Yo, what's up everybody, Professor V here, and this is the lecture for chapter 14, Neurocognitive Disorders and Disorders Related to Aging. Let's go. The category name of these disorders was changed from cognitive to neurocognitive and DSM-5 to better reflect the fact that cognitive functions such as thinking, memory, and attention are closely linked to particular brain regions and neural pathways in the brain. Neurocognitive disorders are not psychologically based. They are caused by physical or medical conditions or drug use and withdrawal that affect the functioning of the brain. Nevertheless, psychological and environmental factors play key roles in determining the impact and range of the symptoms. The DSM-5 classifies disorders of neurocognitive functioning by organizing them into three types of disorders, delirium, mild neurocognitive disorder, and major neurocognitive disorder. We will look at each individually right after this short video. Some part of me was ripped apart as I watched the daily losses Mom suffered as she slowly slipped away. Yet as devastating as Alzheimer's is, our family somehow managed to grasp every bit of life, every bit of hope, and every bit of love that was possible. Sitting with my mother at the piano, I would play her favorites. Some days the music would spark a memory and she would sing along. But... More often than not, he would just smile. If I had gone away, I might have shed less tears, but I wouldn't have the memory of one particular evening. I walked into the family room, kissed my dad, then walked over to my mom, gave her a big, Hi, Mom, and bent down to kiss her, just as I had done so many times before. But this evening, this one evening, she did more than just smile back and give me a little kiss. This evening, for the first time in a very long time, she clapped her hands and said, Mary, and then she smiled. And that was it. Not another word. Just Mary. It was the last time I would ever hear my mother call out my name, Mary. How wonderful it sounded to my ears. And as gut-wrenching as it felt years before when Mom didn't recognize me, it was somehow assuaged by how exhilarating this felt. And that moment lifted me higher than you could imagine. Having a sound mind and a sound body is an ancient prescription for a healthy and happy life. However, brain diseases and injuries can make us unsound both in body and mind. When damage to the brain results from an injury or stroke, the deterioration in cognitive, social, and occupational functioning can be rapid and severe. In the case of a more gradual but progressive form of deterioration, such as Alzheimer's disease, the decline of mental functioning is more gradual, but eventually leads to a state of virtual helplessness, as with Mary's mother. Delirium is a state of extreme mental confusion interfering with concentration and the ability to speak coherently. Some of the associated features of delirium are difficulty filtering out irrelevant stimuli or shifting attention, excited speech that conveys little meaning, disorientation as to time and place, frightening hallucinations, or other perceptual distortions. Motor behavior may slow to a stupor or fluctuate between states of restlessness and stupor and mental states may fluctuate between lucid intervals and periods of confusion. The lifetime prevalence of delirium in the population is estimated to be between 1 and 2 percent overall, but higher among older adults. There are several specifiers of subtypes defined in the DSM-5, which is delirium due to a general medical condition, substance intoxication delirium, substance withdrawal delirium, or medication-induced delirium. Those that have chronic alcoholism who abruptly stop drinking may experience delirium tremors or DTs. 
DTs are characterized by body tremors, states of agitation, irritability, confusion, disorientation, and even hallucinations. They can last for a week or more and are best treated in a hospital. Delirium also involves a widespread disruption of brain activity, possibly resulting from imbalances in the levels of certain neurotransmitters. Delirium develops really fast when compared to other neurocognitive disorders in which we will be discussing, sometimes in just a few hours or over a course of a few days and involves more clearly disturbed processes, processes of attention and awareness. Delirium also can clear up just as fast, often spontaneously, when the underlying medical or drug-related cause is resolved. Medication can be used to reduce the symptoms. However, if the underlying causes persist, it can lead to further deterioration, which may progress to a disability, coma, or even death. For instance, let's apply delirium to Shelly. Her mind wanders. She can't shift attention to new tasks. Her thinking is disorganized and marked by incoherent speech. She is often disoriented, has difficulty staying awake, and sometimes misinterprets sensory stimuli. Her disorder is most likely delirium. Major neurocognitive disorder is profound deterioration of mental functioning. It is also commonly referred to as dementia. All mental functions are affected, such as memory, thinking processes, attention, and judgment. There are many causes to major neurocognitive disorder. However, the most frequent cause is Alzheimer's disease. Others include various brain diseases and infections or disorders affecting the functioning of the brain. We will discuss a few in a moment. Other cognitive deficits seen in major neurocognitive disorders are aphasia, apraxia, agnosia, and disturbance in executive functioning. Aphasia is the impaired ability to comprehend and or produce speech. There are several types of aphasia. In sensory or receptive aphasia, people have difficulty understanding written or spoken language, but retain the ability to express themselves through speech. In motor aphasia, the ability to express thoughts through speech is impaired, but a person can understand spoken language. A person with a motor aphasia may not be able to summon up the names of familiar objects or may scramble the normal order of words. Apraxia is the impaired ability to perform purposeful movements despite an absence of any deficit in motor functioning. Agnosia is the inability to recognize objects despite an intact sensory system. Agnosias may be limited to specific sensory channels. A person with a visual agnosia may not be able to identify a fork when shown a picture of the object, although he or she has an intact visual system and may be able to identify the object if allowed to touch it and manipulate it by hand. Auditory agnosia is marked by impairments in the ability to recognize sounds and tactile agnosia, people are unable to identify objects such as coins or keys by holding them or touching them. Disturbance in executive functioning include deficits in planning, organizing, or sequencing activities, or in engaging in abstract thinking. Impaired memory is a major feature of major neurocognitive disorder because of Alzheimer's disease. However, as discussed, major neurocognitive disorder affects many mental functions. It all depends on the part of the brain affected by the underlying condition. In very few cases, major neurocognitive disorder can be halted or even reversed when it is caused by certain types of tumors, seizures, treatable infections, or when it results from depression or substance abuse. However, the majority of cases, including the most common form, dementia due to Alzheimer's disease, it follows a progressive and irreversible course. Dementia usually occurs in people over the age of 80, but can develop before then. Late onset of dementia is when it occurs after the age of 65, and early onset dementia is when it occurs before the age of 65. Dementia is not a consequence of aging, as many reach these ages with no signs of major neurocognitive disorder. It is signs of a degenerative brain disease, such as Alzheimer's disease. 
Mild neurocognitive disorder is a newly recognized disorder in DSM-5 that applies to people who suffer a mild or modest decline in cognitive functioning from their prior level. People with mild neurocognitive disorder or MCI are able to function independently and complete tasks of daily living at home and on the job, but may experience difficulty completing tasks that used to come more easily. Mild impairment of cognitive functioning usually occurs in the early stages of neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's disease and other diseases affecting the brain. However, not everyone who develops MCI goes on to develop Alzheimer's disease, thankfully. Forgetting where we left our keys is a form of ordinary forgetfulness that becomes more common as we age. Matter of fact, where did I put mine at? Forgetting what keys are for is a possible sign of neurocognitive disorder that needs to be evaluated more thoroughly. I was stepping on him. Alzheimer's disease, or AD, is a degenerative brain disease that leads to progressive and irreversible dementia, characterized by memory loss and deterioration of other cognitive functions, including judgment and ability to reason. Although the cause of Alzheimer's is unknown, it is associated with the formation of plaques and tangled nerve fibers in the brain. Genetic factors appear to contribute as well as environmental factors. The risk of AD increase with age with more than 99% of cases occurring in those age 65 or older. Women are at higher risk than men. However, this may be because women tend to just live longer. Although AD is strongly connected to aging, it is a degenerative brain disease and not a consequence of normal aging, just like major neurocognitive disorder. Suspicions of AD are raised when cognitive impairment is more severe and affecting someone's ability for meeting ordinary responsibilities such as daily work and social roles. They may begin to get lost in a parking lot, in a store, or even their own home. They may become depressed, confused, or even delusional when they sense their mental abilities slipping away and do not understand why. They may begin to forget the names of loved ones, fail to recognize them, or even forget their own name. While they may fail to recognize their own children or other family members, they may still remember having children and other family members, leading them to believe that they don't care about them because they never see them, even though they may be their primary caretaker and see them every day. AD has struck a number of notable people, including former President Ronald Reagan, shown here with his wife Nancy, at his first public appearance after being diagnosed with AD. Ronald Reagan died of the disease in June of 2004. Before 2012, a diagnosis of AD was merely an educated guess and confirmed after death in an autopsy. It wasn't until 2012 that brain imaging technology allowed doctors to diagnose AD based on brain scans that showed plaques associated with the disease with clinical evidence of memory loss. In time, it may be able to predict which patients with MCI may progress to Alzheimer's disease. The early stages of AD are marked by limited memory problems and subtle personality changes. People may at first have trouble managing their finances, remembering recent events or basic information such as telephone numbers, area codes, zip codes, and the name of their grandchildren, and even performing numerical computations. In moderately severe AD, people require assistance in managing everyday tasks. At this stage, Alzheimer's patients may be unable to select appropriate clothes or recall their addresses or names of family members. If Rico suffered from AD, he would experience the inability to remember the names and addresses of fa friends and family members. He also has large gaps in his memory for recent events and experiences. He cannot remember his complete address, and he sometimes forgets the name of his spouse upon whom he is completely dependent. He needs assistance with bathing and toileting. He paces, walk, walking in short, slow steps, and he rarely talks in complete sentences anymore. He is often agitated to the point of acting out his emotions. These are all characteristics of moderately severe Alzheimer's disease. People with advanced Alzheimer's disease may start talking to themselves or experience visual hallucinations or paranoid delusions. If Rico's AD progressed to the advanced stages, 
he would experience symptoms of the early stage, moderately severe stage, and is incontinent, unable to walk or speak, and requires assistance in toileting and feeding. Most times he is entirely mute and inattentive to his environment. Some people with AD are not aware of their deficits. Others deny them. At first, they may attribute their problems to other causes such as stress or fatigue. Denial may protect people with AD in the early or mild stages of the disease from recognizing that their intellectual abilities are declining and the recognition that their mental abilities are slipping away may lead to depression. AD wrecks havoc not only on the affected person, but also the entire family. Families who helplessly watch their loved ones slowly deteriorate have been described as attending a funeral that never ends. Oh, it's been over a year that, that, that I was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. I think it came from my doctor, okay, and uh, I... Uh, Remember those tests that yeah, they Yeah, they gave me a bunch of tests. But the, my first time they said to me, they said, you're dead. <laughs> I said, what? I said, you're dead. I said, well, do you want me to lay down that? Uh, uh, you know, it's just, I was joking with them then, but uh, they said that uh, you need to do something about it now. I didn't want to tell my family that I had Alzheimer's disease at first, so I didn't want people knocking on my door and, you know, going to me showing up with, you know, you know, huggets and cryings and all of that, especially my grandkids, you know. And that's it. Then I have to explain to them what death is and all of that. So, so that was a very difficult time for me. Just that part right there, most difficult than anything else. One of, one of the really early, um, actually before Alvin was uh, officially diagnosed, um, when he knew that he was going to be retiring from the college. Mm -hmm. That's when he asked me to help him uh, negotiate with the college the terms of his retirement mm -hmm. and try to figure out what he should do in terms of setting up his pension plan. And I realized when I, I had explained to him a couple times what I thought, how I thought that the pensions might be set up and how his money might be arranged. And I was really shocked when at one point, I mean, we were like several weeks into talking about this. He turned to me and said, what do you mean I'm going to have less income than I do now? And the whole sort of change, I, I thought I had gone over it and over it and over it, and I just didn't realize it's, that's one of the real difficulties, is there, there's no sign that goes off that says, yes, he's understanding it, or no, he's not understanding it. Um, and the suggestion from the psychiatrist uh, was ask him to repeat it back but you know that gets really awkward sometimes I mean it's, it's, it feels very childish I think he probably had been systematic uh, symptomatic a couple months before then um, but he's always this is one of the things with even even his doctor says um, well he never used to make his doctor's appointments so I just thought it was Alvin the artist just not keeping his appointments Alvin was the most organized person I've ever met in my life. He had everything in perfect order, and he knew where everything was and how to get to it. And when he started with the Alzheimer's, he would misplace things and not get... And I think a lot of it was because he was so busy, too. He didn't have time to put things back where they were, and they kind of ended up getting in piles. If you walk off the, if you walk up this door here, and there's a bunch of boxes right there by the door, and there's some keys hanging there, and if you walk out the door, the first box has flashlights in it. The second box <laughs> has has uh, my keys hanging on thing there by the door. Everything that it might say, did you forget anything? They check again before you leave. But how many hours have you and I spent looking for things? We spent a lot Many of hours. hours looking for stuff. There has been a change in his personality a bit. Um, he, she used the word frustrated. 
I use the word agitated. He can get when he's tired, if something's not going his way, or if he, or he doesn't quite understand something, instead of just saying, explain it again, or I can't understand it, he'll get really, really agitated and focused on something, and it's very hard to talk him down from that. It just you sort of have to just let it pass. And I'm, my concern is that, that that's a prelude of what's to come with, with Alzheimer's. This girl drives me crazy. <laughs> I thought, did I call you an old lady? <laughs> she calls me and tells me, did you take your meds? Don't lie to me. He lies about it. He admits <laughs> it now. He lies about it. He, he calls and says, I took my meds, um, and I come Friday to pick him up, and they're all still in the box. And it's, it's a box them. this big, hasn't and it's got them. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday on it. And then, Why do so, you lie about it? Well, what happened is that I'm busy working, okay? I get busy working. Something happens, you know. It's so. short-term memory. Mm -hmm. I'll so. call him and say, take your meds, and he'll say, oh, yes, I'm going to do that. And then, you know, he'll walk up through the studio and start doing something else, and he just has completely forgotten mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. He does has gotten lost a few times, but usually he'll see something that he recognizes, and he'll, you know, turn around and go back the other way or he loves to walk. He walks a lot. And he'll, sometimes he, he'll call me. He usually brings his cell phone with him when he's walking, which is a good idea. And a few times he's called me and told me where he was. And, you know, I just suggest to him the best way to get where he's trying to go. I've got lost a couple of times. And I didn't know what street I was and where I was going. All right? And so Paul, this guy Paul, I was saying to Paul, you know what? She, he says, what do you do when you get lost? I says, uh, there's a song. It's a, one of these old doo-wop songs. It's called Gonna Find It. And I'm searching every which way, so Paul and I got up and sing it. So what it is, you, 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 you look to your right, you look to your left, you see what you know and what you don't, and you go that way. And that helped me learn how to find things in the middle of the night. It, it's it's hard to do sometimes. You keep the location. Yeah, it's hard to do sometimes. Okay, but that's sing Paul's song. I'm gonna find it. <laughs> go on the road there, cause I remember I go down the road and say, I know there's a house on the left there, and I know there's a store coming up. There's a it's on Allen Pond Road, and on that store there, it has it's, it has a different name from the rest of the stores. So I can go by there and get some milk and some soda and some stuff to do snack on. And I can get, I eat fish a lot. They make a smoked fish in a package there, salmon, you know, and it's already got stuff on it. You have to open it up. Once you open it up, then you gotta. He can't stay on target, um, and we're concerned about that. Um, his mind just goes down paths um, and, and wanders very easily. Alzheimer's can devastate patients, families, spouses usually provide the bulk of daily care and also bear the emotional cost of watching their loved ones slipping away day after day. The causes of AD is unknown, however, there are few correlations in which have been found the formation of plaques and tangled nerve fibers in the brain. Plaques are abnormal clusters of chemically sticky proteins called beta amyloid that build up between nerve cells. The research has shown that the buildup of these plaques damage networks of neurons in the brain that are responsible for memory formation and storage. There are genetic factors of AD. There are combinations of genes that can result in a higher chance of developing AD. However, one in particular has been shown to increase those chances by three times. This gene is called the APOE4 gene. Other environmental factors do play a role, but researchers are unsure which particular environmental factors. Stress is the suspected culprit though. Patients with Alzheimer's disease tend to have abnormally low levels of acetylcholine neurotransmitters and abnormally high levels of glutamate neurotransmitters. There are drug treatments to help with this. Donopazil, a drug used to treat Alzheimer's disease, increases levels of acetylcholine. Memantine is a drug aimed at treating moderate to severe Alzheimer's disease by blocking glutamate. 
The problem with these medications is that donopazil only produces small or modest improvements in cognitive functioning in those with moderate or severe AD. With mimetine, evidence falls short to support the benefits of the drug over a placebo in treating mild forms of AD. Antipsychotic medication can also help with the aggressiveness or agitated behavior often seen in those with dementia, but they can carry significant risks. To help prevent AD, participation in mentally challenging tasks such as solving puzzles, reading newspapers, playing word games, and so on can help boost cognitive performance in people with mild to moderate AD. Just by going to college, you're reducing your risk of ever developing AD. Following a healthy diet, avoiding smoking, and exercising regularly may boost cognitive functioning in late adulthood. There is evidence to suggest that physical fitness in middle adulthood lowers the risk of dementia in later adulthood. Guess I better get started on this. Vascular neurocognitive disorder, formerly called vascular dementia or multi-infarcid dementia, is a form of major or mild neurocognitive disorder resulting from cerebrovascular events or strokes affecting the brain. These cerebrovascular accidents or CVAs are strokes or brain damage resulting in a disruption in blood supply to the brain. Vascular neurocognitive dementia ranks second to Alzheimer's disease as being the most common form. The symptoms include impaired memory and language ability, agitation, emotional instability, unable to attend to basic needs. When compared to Alzheimer's dementia, vascular neurocognitive disorder comes on more abruptly. A single stroke may produce aphasia as well. Vascular neurocognitive disorders account for about one in five cases of dementia. Frontotemporal neurocognitive disorder is characterized by deterioration, thinning or shrinkage, of brain tissue in the frontal and temporal lobes of the cerebral cortex. This disorder typically takes the form of progressive dementia, symptomatically similar to AD. It causes Alzheimer's-like symptoms and cognitive deterioration, including memory loss and socially inappropriate behaviors, as well as flagrant sexual behavior and a loss of modesty, but it does not involve the presence of plaques and neurofiber tangles in the brain. Originally known as Pick's disease, usually begins in middle age and has a genetic component. It accounts for 6 to 12% of all dementias. Head traumas may injure the brain by jarring, banging, or cutting brain tissue. Neurocognitive impairment is more likely to occur from multiple head traumas than from a single accident. Delirium, agitation, and amnesia may result from severe concussions. Contusions can lead to coma, cognitive impairment, and emotional problems. Lacerations can be lethal or lead to major permanent cognitive impairments. Substance medication-induced neurocognitive disorders are caused by the use of or withdrawal from psychoactive substances or medications which can impair brain functioning. The most common example is Korsakoff syndrome, which involves irreversible memory loss due to brain damage resulting from deficiency of the vitamin B1, thiamine. Korsakoff syndrome is most closely associated with chronic alcohol use. The memory impairments in Korsakoff syndrome persist for years after the person stops drinking. Someone with this syndrome lacks insight and is unable to discriminate between actual events and the wild. They invent implausible stories to fill the gaps in their memory and they truly believe these stories actually happen, no matter the contradictory evidence. Neurocognitive disorders due to Lewy body dementia results from abnormal protein deposits that form within the nucleus of cells and parts of the brain. It accounts for about 10% of dementias in older adults. The disease has features of both AD and Parkinson's. In addition to profound cognitive decline, the distinguishing features of neurocognitive disorder due to Lewy body's disease is the appearance of fluctuating alertness and attention marked by frequent periods of drowsiness and staring into space.
as well as recurrent visual hallucinations and rigid body movements and stiff muscles typical of Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease is characterized by involuntary shaking or tremors, motor disabilities, and possible cognitive impairment. Parkinson's disease involves destruction of brain tissue and the substantia nigra of the brain which plays a role in controlling body movements. The disease also involves reductions in the level of dopamine in the brain. Dementia eventually occurs in about 80% of people with Parkinson's. Depression may result not only from coping with the illness but also from neurobiological changes in the brain caused by the illness. Huntington's disease is a genetically transmitted disease that involves progressive deterioration in the basal ganglia, which primarily affects neurons that produce acetylcholine and GABA. The symptoms usually first appear between the ages of 30 and 50 and involve involuntary jerky movements of the face, grimaces, neck, limbs, and trunk, which are accompanied by neurocognitive decline. The disease is progressive and death usually occurs within 15 years of the onset of symptoms. The human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, can attack the central nervous system causing progressive decline in mental and motor functioning. Few develop HIV-related dementia without having full-blown AIDS, but 25% of those with AIDS develop cognitive impairments that can develop into a neurocognitive disorder. In advanced stages, it may cause delusions, disorientation, and delirium. Prion disease can cause brain damage when clusters of abnormal prion molecules spread within the brain. Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease is a prion disease that results in the formation of small cavities that resemble the holes in a sponge in the brain. Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease is caused by a slow-acting virus. A variant of Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease is related to mad cow disease, a fatal illness spread by eating infected beef. It is rare but also fatal. Death occurs within months of a diagnosis. Going back to head trauma or traumatic brain injuries, amnesia or memory loss frequently follows a traumatic event such as a blow to the head, electric shock, or a major surgical operation. There are two general types of amnesia. Retrograde amnesia, which is the loss of memory of past events and personal information, and anteriograde amnesia, the inability or difficulty forming or storing new memories. In some cases of retrograde amnesia, some people retain remote memories of the past but lose recent memories. Most victims of post-traumatic amnesia typically recover their memory completely in time. In anteriograde amnesia, there are problems forming new memory, which may be revealed by an inability to remember the names of or recognize people whom the person met a few minutes earlier. A famous case, perhaps the most famous case of anteriograde amnesia, is Henry Maliason, otherwise known as Patient HM. HM suffered from seizures that were occurring in the medial parts of his temporal lobes of the brain. At the age of 27, he had his medial temporal lobes of the brain removed surgically to control his epilepsy. He developed severe anteriograde amnesia and could not form a completely new memory from then on. The medial temporal lobes house the hippocampus of the brain, which is responsible for the formation of long-term memories. Note, the hippocampus is not where long-term memories are stored. They are stored all over the brain in packs of neural networks called engrams. HM was born in 1926, had a bicycle accident at the age of seven that was often linked to the cause of the epilepsy, started having more severe seizures at age 16, had the operation in 1953 at the age of 27, and suffered from anterior grade amnesia until his death in 2008. For 55 years, HM could not form a new memory. Or so many thoughts. From 1953 until his death in 2008, he was studied and gave much insight to how memory works and the different types of memory. He was able to form new procedural memories or memories on how to complete tasks. However, he could not form the memory of actually completing the task. More on Henry Meliason in a future video. It's actually one of the cases that got me really interested in neuroscience. 
Generalized anxiety disorder and phobic disorders are the most commonly occurring anxiety disorders among older people. Approximately 1 in 10 adults over the age of 55 suffer from a diagnosable anxiety disorder. Anxiolytics are often used to treat anxiety and the elderly. Depression is common among people in later life and may be associated with memory deficits that can lift as depression clears, which is not the case in the more progressive dementias, such as those caused by Alzheimer's disease. Approximately 1 and 5% of older adults are currently suffering from a diagnosable major depressive episode. As with treatment discussed in earlier chapters, depression is treated by medication and psychotherapy. Certain sleep disorders such as insomnia and sleep apnea are also common among older adults. Upward of 50% of older adults report sleep problems. It is often linked to other psychological disorders such as depression, dementia, anxiety disorders, as well as medical illnesses. Psychosocial factors such as loneliness and the related difficulty of sleeping alone after the loss of a spouse also implicated in many cases. Sleep medications are often used but can cause side effects. Long-term use of medications among the elderly can lead to dependence on these sleep aids. And this wraps up the lecture for Abnormal Psychology Chapter 14. Hope you enjoyed it, learned something you didn't know, didn't forget anything that was said, and I will see you in the next lecture. Ciao.